Yes. Call to order the City of Trinidad work session, January 23rd, 2023. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, individual, liberty, and justice. See, we've got some guests tonight. Michael? I'm here. You're here. We'll open up the work session. You can come forward and... All right. Well, um, today you have in front of you Article 3. And I, I wanted to give a... I'm going to give a real high level where everything's at on the code. Um, and then we can get into Article 3. The, the reason you only got Article 3 is that I started making changes to the other sections and realized very quickly that if you didn't like Article 3, I was wasting a lot of my time. Moreover, I was going to not be able to like remember all my changes and I was going to screw up your code. Um, so that's why you have today Article 3 changes uh, the subdivision code uh, and also changes the zoning code with conditional uses and variances where basically it takes those pro like conditional use and variances takes the pro current process that's in there, scrapes it, and makes it a limited impact review. So then it refers back to Article 3. So at your next meeting, what we will do is we'll go through the remainder of articles that were changed. Um, definitions are going to be moved up to Article 1. Uh, right now they're at the bottom of your code. And then there's also um, there's some definitions that are living within the body of the code that I put back into definitions. I am leaving signs and uh, sign definitions and wireless communication facilities, those definitions um, on their own. You will see in Article 3 on page, if you want to flip to your actual code, on page, that would be page um, 4, you'll see this list of other application types. So you can see starting with Article 7, They've all, they've basically been renumbered, but seven is annexation, eight is uh, sign permit, flood permit, vested property rights, et cetera. So these all, and the reason they're staying where they're at or staying not, <coughs> they're not either administrative limited impact or major impact is because your code currently has very detailed processes for all of these sites applications. And um, to be honest with you, like, the only one I could actually even see becoming a different to actually move into the process was sexually oriented businesses. But given how extensive that article is, I think it's just best to keep it in there. Right now there's some administrative actions that are taken by the manager on certain applications. So I, I think it's not worth getting into that those things. And I'll be honest with you, the SOB stuff is outside of really my scope of what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so I'm just going to leave it going. At the next planner, you're going to get really wants to dive into sexually oriented businesses, and you guys can open up that can of worms. Um, but you can see here that basically all of these kind of have their own sections and their own review processes. So with that, um, so in Article One, the only other there's there's a couple definitions that we will address come March. Uh, you have a definition of affordable housing. Uh, and you have a couple other ones that really don't jive with the code. Um, we'll get into the next steps here in a minute, but that I'll bring bring those minor definition tweaks uh, back. There's a definition now to um, that we added through the Housing Now Incentive Program that we put in Chapter One, but the council also wanted to insert in Chapter Fourteen. Uh, Long-term rental and primary residence will also be inserted in your code. Primary what? Residence. Oh. So, um, I don't think those are big things for the Planning Commission to insert in the code, but uh, those two were added. Uh, when I started the Housing Now program, the reference as the reference and deed restrictions that are really important definitions in the deed restrictions that anyone gets that funding. And then in the long run, as you guys potentially start to get into more true affordable housing or housing applications, that gives the planning commission a little bit more latitude, and if someone wants to ask for certain above and beyond, you can say, "Well, you need to provide us residences that are primary residences or residences that are long-term rentals," and you can reference to those two. Do we like densities in there too? 
no, no densities in that definition of primary. So if, the reason you, so, so real quick, I'll deviate. I don't want to get off. No, it's fine, no, it's fine, I'll be quick on this. The Housing Now program, we deed restrict the properties. Anyone that's receiving funding from the Housing Now, in exchange for that funding, the city is getting a deed restriction. So they're voluntarily putting a deed restriction on their property. That deed restriction basically states that that property, that, that unit that they're getting the funding for has to be a primary residence or a long-term rental. And we define, the key is that statutorily, long-term rentals are defined as 31 days or more. We defined it as, what, six months, I think it yeah. was. We, we put a little bit bigger of a time frame on that so that it truly is a long-term rental. So it's a six-month lease. Okay. So what, what's nice about that is if, like, for instance, you get a large planned unit development and developers wanting densities or... Right, right, right. Because really, now, the uh, way our code is, there really ain't a clear thing on density. No. <laughs> that is uh, that's an issue of your code. Anyway, I sorry. No, no, you're good. You're I'm good. an off code. I'm an off code. No, that's fine. Um, so Article 1 was definitions removed into there, um, and um, and also you'll notice in this article there is a definition around, um, or there is a citation to public notice. We put in a formal public notice section uh, into all of these. Well, that's good. Yeah. Um, and I think you actually, in my memo, the public notice is, is in that memo um, right now. Sorry, you guys are seeing my screen this time. Um, I want to make sure I don't mess up on my code sections here. Yeah, so then Article 2, or what I changed in Article 2 is right now you currently have um, boards. Right now it's just Planning, Zoning, and Variance Commission. Where are you? I, I'm not in the memo. Oh, okay. I'm just, I'm, I have, this is my folder. Got it, got it. Sorry. I'm just going through each, I can, I've been in. I was going to ask the same thing. So but, uh, <laughs> I'm just going through a big picture of got it, got how it. your new code is structured. And just basically reassuring you that I really didn't screw with your code. Um, but I did add definitions in a public notice article one. You saw that, you can see the public notice. Definitions are not changing, they're just moving up, absent the ones I just discussed. And I'll bring all this back to you at this next meeting. But I want to just, just so you can see the big picture. Article 3 is completely new. And that is what we're discussing tonight. That is application review this year. So that is a completely new section that is no, that was not there. Article, sorry, I jumped over Article 2. Article 2 now contains Planning and Zoning Commission, Historic Preservation, and Board of Appeals. So I moved, they were all in three separate sections. I just put them there. Nothing's changing. They're just all under Article 2 now. Um, and that actually helps me out a bunch with numbering, but that's not a your concern, but it just does. Um, and it also makes the code read, like you should have one place to go figure out what the planning and zoning, the bell or the appeals in, the, in one section. Um, zoning, really no changes anticipated in zoning outside of a di different discussion out of this. Again, this whole discussion and recodification effort is really based on review procedures. We are going to kind of touch our toe into some entitlements because there's a couple things that we need to deal with like um, like accessory structures have like a really bad that says front of the property line instead of the front of the house. So there's some things that are just wonky that we'll talk, touch in March to try to fix. Um, but I'm really trying to stay away from entitlements unless you guys specifically want me to look at something while we have it. The issue with going into entitlements again is that I think once we do that, we want to bring in a much more robust public process because we're then affecting people's ability to develop the property. Um, Article 5 subdivision regulations is going to be a pretty significant rewrite because every single subdivision right now has a different process and now they'll either be a limited impact or they'll either be administrative limited or major. That's how they'll be classified. And so their processes will follow one of those three, and that's what they do. All the review criteria is in Article 3 as far as the submittal requirements. Um, and we'll get into that here in just a minute. Article 6 is going to remain the same. Um, there's really no changes. There's a couple minor tweaks that we'll bring before. I think like the retaining wall height doesn't meet the IBC standard. It's three feet, and it says 48, 48 inches requires a permit. So we'll just fix some really minor stuff around So it's staying about the same? 
Huh? Is that what you're it's saying? Say, it's saying uh, from where I sit today, it's saying the same. Again, we can look at that moving forward. Uh, and then Article 7 through Article 15 are just those separate processes that I just discussed. So that that is the kind of expedited review, codification, developer friendly, what we're here for tonight. So you can see that really the meat of everything I touched is Article 3. Uh, again, uh, my plan is in February to bring you Art, uh, Article 5 subdivisions and Article 4 zoning, just so you can see how the text was edited uh, for conditional use variance and for all the subdivisions. There will also be in subdivisions, there's also a couple other things that you wanted to discuss around condos and townhouses. So those will be in your code section. So I think we're going to need a whole meeting in February to discuss that. So with that, we'll jump in. So any questions around the big picture? Does that all make sense to everyone? It does. Okay, great. All right. So what you'll see on the screen here is there's some mo there's some um, there's some red lines that that you'll see on my screen. Those red lines are a result of me meeting with the city staff. We reviewed the whole code um, at a development developer what do you guys call development team review, review team meeting? Yeah, develop, development team meeting. Yeah, uh, last Friday. So I, you guys wanted this ahead of time. I made sure you guys got the draft. I'll point them out so you don't have to stare at this. <laughs> um, uh, but real quick, I want to I want to kind of start with the, the table of contents because I think this is this is really the meat of kind of just talk. This I'm going to go through what each of these sections contain, and then we can get into the nuances in line by line if we want to, or we can just kind of go over the changes. But this is really important. So the purpose of the article obviously is to establish a development application and review procedures. Uh, development permits. So that is the section that outlines what you, from your direction, what each of the development permits are labeled as, either administrative, limited, or major. So double check that list, um, and we can do that when we go through it. But I, I'm pretty sure that we we got that correct because we got the got the feedback from the tables that we did. Um, Exemption from development permits, there's basically some just exemptions that exist under statute. Uh, those are listed in the code. Um, a lot of that's around, um, I actually have to go back and check that myself. Um, oh, permitted use and then anything that's exempt under, under uh, state and federal regulations. A lot of that you guys don't really deal with a lot of exemptions because you're a city and counties, there's a lot. Of course, it moved. All right. Uh, classification of developments. Again, that's a uh, limited impact, uh, administrative lim limited impact, and uh, major. Then development plan. Development plan is where we're going to spend a majority of our time tonight. That is actually the required submittals. And that list you'll see from some of the changes from the staff is quite ex uh, extensive. But again, the whole purpose of that extensive list is that the staff can choose what's requirement and what's not. So the idea is that it will go through the process on a major application or a limited impact in application because they already conduct a development review team meeting. What they do is they have that initial conversation with the applicant in the room with all the departments. The departments go, I need to see X, Y, and Z. And there's actually, as part of this, you'll see, there's actually a letter from the staff that goes to the applicant to tell tells them what they're required to submit. So it's not a, they can't, you know, they know right up front, here are the requirements. Here's the requirements, and this is what we need in this amount of time, so on and so forth. Yep. And then as we go through each of these, you'll see there's a timeline for the applicant to return their applications, and then the process begins once this team complete. Rachel. I have a question on the classification of development. Sure. Um, C is listed as townhouse conversion subdivision under just administrative review. Yep. That seems like a big thing for. Am I missing something? Let's talk about, I, 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 you, it, you are missing, I'll get really into that. Okay. I'm gonna, 
I'm going to really deviate, but okay. we'll talk about that here when we get to administrative, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Okay. That's a great question, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, so then, again, you have administrative review, which goes through that, and then you'll notice that after administrative review, there's a requirement for pre-application. So anything that's a limited impact or major impact does require you to come into the city and have a pre-app conference with the development review team on a Friday. I think what they do currently is amazing. I've sat through a couple. It's a great luxury to actually have all of the department heads sitting there because as you know, development isn't just planning. It's utilities, it's right. streets, it's everyone. It's electric and they get all those questions answered. So. I was actually really impressed that the city already does that. That was one of the first things I instituted when I went to Slida, was we actually had a development review team where I brought in fire, public works, everyone for bigger applications so that everyone was sitting around the table. Um, because there was a lot of like, the, plant, the public works director telling me and then me telling the applicant, and I was like, well, Michael said so. <laughs> <laughs> and I was also 24 at the time, so I, you know, attention span of a rabbit. Um, but uh, again, taking advantage of that process that's already in place is really, really ideal. Then we go through the limited impact review procedures, major impact. Um, steps to following approval, that's really the filing of your development plan, uh, public hearings. Um, you'll see there's a table that basically shows when a, what public hearings are required for what levels of applications. Um, concurrent review is a really important section. It's a very small paragraph, but it basically states if you have a, if you have multiple applica multiple applications, you can come in front of the planning commission once, and they can consider all your applications in one development plan. And that's that is in here. That's in concurrent review. So it's a very small paragraph. What page is that? It's at the very bottom of your. It's uh, section. Thirty-nine point two. It's on oh, the very, skip. very bottom. Okay, I was still. No, you're good. I was still here in the classification. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to go through it line by line. Okay. I'm just trying to give you an overview. Okay, got it. Um, format of submittals basically says thou shall provide a as built as built, and then the other nice luxury that this code does grant an applicant is um, insubstantial changes. So a developer can come in and say, you know, before they file their plat, we, we went out there and we need to move a property line two feet this direction. The manager can say, that doesn't substantially change your application, we approve it. So that's what's really nice is you don't have to go through a whole other meeting if there's a small modification to a plat. Now the manager can say, oh, nope, that's, that's more than I feel comfortable signing off on and kick it back to the review. So how long can they come in after that? How much time do they have? Uh, to, on, on what? On that right there, that one. That 14394. Uh, let's look. I don't think there is. There's no time limit? No, but there is a there is a time limit um, on major. There is a time limit. It's up above in the application, okay. and I believe it's six months to file. So, uh, 60 days. You have 60 days to file your, your final plan. And so if it's outside of 60 days, then your, your approval lapses. I see. So, the idea is that, and you, and you can see by the, the concurrence on like a major impact. Well, you need to get it done. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Yep. So, all right, so jumping into the code now. So any questions about the overall format? No, sir. Okay. So, getting into um, development permits. So, again, this basically is saying that the first requirement is basically anything that's required. Um, and you can see here that what, what it's stating, subdivision, Article 4, et cetera. So, it's, it's basically telling you that unless it's permitted, use, it requires a development permit. Again, that's the same thing in R14-32 is filling out your use table as permitted uh, and not requiring a development permit. However, it does say in here that just because it's permitted, 
it doesn't exempt you from a building permit, a sign permit, or a footprint permit if it's required. So basically, if it's permitted, what it's saying is then you just go right to Chris's office and get a restart with building permit. You don't need to go through this process. Make sense? All right, so classifications. So under here, um, and we'll get into the townhouse conversion. So administrative review, uh, townhouse conversion. And so the, we can go through each of these, but these are the ones that you, you, you uh, slated um, as administrative. So why townhouse? So the issue with townhouses, and it's a, it's a procedural, it's, it's how townhouses occur in, in the development process. You cannot actually do a townhouse plat until the party wall is constructed. The issue with then inserting a review by the Planning and Zoning Commission is that you are going to wind up costing, especially what I deal with, affordable housing, you're gonna cost somebody their interest rate. Because if, if they have to wait 30 days to get in front of it, and then another 30 day period to actually hear their application, that house is gonna be constructed and it's gonna be sitting vacant and empty before the plaque can be filed. Why can't you do that before the thing? Because the, the actual line has to go through the actual two hour firewall. But, so what that does is, so it allows somebody to come in and file a plat. Now, the only time it occurs where this is administrative review and it, does, it doesn't fall, it falls outside of your purview is on a duplex, one duplex. What you normally have, for instance, you have a, a, a I don't want to talk specifics because I don't know, I'm sure it's come through here, so I don't want to talk about an active application, but I'll give an example of an app application, but not, try not to do this. What normally happens is someone comes in and wants to do four blocks of townhomes. So they want to build four, or fourplex, 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 fourplex. What they do is they do come in for a limited impact review because they're going to have to do a minor subdivision at that point. Minor so, or major? Minor. Or it could be major. Right. It depends on the number of lots. Right? That, can, that concerns me right there, the townhouse conversion subdivision. So it only, if it's not zoned for... Well, well let's, let's back... Let me let me explain how the cadence. Okay. I, I understand what you're. I understand what you're. It's like it's being slipped in there. It's to, not. It's it is being slipped in. It's being slipped in. But yeah. it's being slipped in after a review process already occurs. So if you're going to be if you're so going to be if it's you're, limit, it's under the administrative review. Again, let me let me finish. Okay. So so if you have again the only way it's an administrative review is if it's one unit. That's it. If it's one duplex. Says yeah, because because anything anything beyond a because not all duplexes are townhouses. Townhouse is no, different I, than I, duplex. You no, know, a, a townhouse could be eight units wide, right. but you'll see that after you get past duplex, you're in a limited impact multifamily. Where are we at? Where are you? The next the next section, the next page, limited impact review. So if I'm planning on building multiple townhomes. On multifamily. So then, why does it say townhouse conversion subdivision? It says duplex. So there, it's because how it happens. You have to understand how it happens. So when someone constructs, I've, not, I've, I've built built a lot of townhomes now in my career, and it's it's a cadence thing. So let me explain. When you actually propose your proposed development, so if I'm a, if I'm a, if I'm building an affordable housing project, I'm doing it in Ordway tomorrow tomorrow night with the third council. I am creating one big parcel mm -hmm. and I'm going through a major subdivision. Actually, I'll show you that application so you can see it, so you can actually see how this occurs. This is a great example. So happened to be doing this tomorrow night. So this is the plat that I'm presenting to the council in Ordway. This, so this is this is two blocks of of lots in the town of Ordway. These are all going to be single family, and they're all going to have one house on it. These are all going to be duplexes. I am actually doing a subdivision of a master parcel, and I gave them a development proposal showing the layout of all the duplexes in here 
And then when I'm done, I'm gonna come in and create the property lines through each of the party walls. Mm -hmm. I, for, for me as a developer, I have to, for my bank loan, this all has to be subdivided as one master parcel because the bank is leaning my note on this parcel. Right. The issue is that when I go to sell off each one of these, I have to be preparing a separate plat right. for every single lot. For me to have to come back and to come to you and ask you again for those approvals every time, I'm going no, to miss. No, right, that doesn't, I mean, I'm told, that makes total sense. Right. But what so, so, so yeah, so to your point, in, this, in your new process, this is actually a major subdivision, right. I would come in and say, I intend, in my phasing, mm -hmm. to do this. Okay. And you would say, yes or no. The and administrative when, review would say yes or no. No, no, I, because I'm building 28. I'm right. multifamily. I'm a limited impact. So I would have impact. I'm automatically a limited impact. So I'm coming in for a limited impact application. You're reviewing all 28, you're reviewing my development plan as a whole, and you're saying yes or no. Once you say yes to my limited impact review. And when you say you. You being the planning and zoning. Okay. When, when the planning and zoning says under limited impact says, look at my development plan, okay. and you say yes, then that allows me, once it's built, to come back in and do administrative reviews for townhomes. Okay, gotcha. I think. Does that make sense? Sort of, yes. Let me sort let me yes. give you another example. <laughs> Do we ask a question? Well, no, this is, this is, this is, that's I a guess great. it just, it's just weird to me how it's put in the classification of developments as straight to administrative review versus. Well, it would be, a minute, the only way it would be administrative review one. is if it's, if it's just one. One duplex. Multifamily, anything over two units under your code is limited impact. It goes straight to limited impact, and that's so. What isn't we're that get. confusion what we're trying to fix? It's so not the it's, average. It's not confusion though, because when they bring their full development plan in, mm -hmm. they sit down and they look at the full look at it holistically. That's that's what you, the whole point of this is that you automatically go to the most stringent process depending on how big your development. And they can turn around and say, "This is limited impact. This is what you got to do. Here's your, here's what you, here's what you got to submit, and you have this many days for this." And correct is that okay. correct? Yeah, we'll get into that. So uh, this picture right here, this this whole lot, this whole block, the great examples. There's one, two, three, four, five buildings, six buildings on that block. This is in Crestview. I did this exact process. What I did when my when I came in to, to do this, I plotted six individual lots, right. and I went through a minor subdivision. So I came in and did a limited impact review. Once I got approval, and I show and in Crestview, I actually had to show how every house is going to be built on these lots because they did architectural review as well. When they were completed, they said we're done. They, this could move a foot this way or that way on site once they start constructing. They don't care. What they care about is that the utilities are separated and all that, all the types of stuff. So I came in after the fact and I just filed a plat. The issue is, and this is where it really matters for a developer. The issue is when I'm building this, by the time I'm able to get that survey done and shoot, I have about a 30-day window to file the plat and get that person to closing before they lose their interest rate. If you make them come in here, they're going to lose their interest rate. No, that makes sense. So mm -hmm. that's why you allow townhomes to be the measure review. Because they've already gone through. But the approval for the development of the townhomes is not administrative view. That's Correct. what I was trying yeah. to get yeah. at. Okay. Yeah. That's a great question. So you'll see that under administrative review, so going back to the code, under administrative review, the only way you would actually fall into that is if it's a single duplex. And that's because single family duplex or townhouse is that. Right. And this You're clarifying in, because I think it's been kind of, which I know it's a topic for another discussion, but the use is permitted by right, that chart that we have now is kind of a nightmare. Oh, yeah. So you're fixing that so that 
right? Well, the chart stays the same for now. The low density, medium density, what's allowed in each, blah, 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 because that's where this could get a little hairy, because people are talking about wanting to do a duplex on a single low density, single family lot, right? So. But that has to be, that, is that even allowed on? <laughs> well, yeah. it's been a big fight. Well, that's that's so. So I'm not touching your use table for now. So I'm gonna be honest with you, because again, that gets into entitlements. So I'm not changing your use table. Um, but if it's conditional, then it's limited impact okay. in that table. So um, oh, I, I got it right here. Okay. I'm looking for it. I know what your question is. Okay. It's a good one. So where or how will the public know if it's a conditional use, right, mm -hmm. that it would automatically go to a limited impact status? Like how does all this play into what's permitted by right and condition? It's, it follows your table. Okay. So if it's permitted under your table, the only way they get to go to administrative review is if it's permitted. So right now, two-family dwelling, you're only talking about allowing it in medium density and high density. Right. Right. So, so somewhere it's going to say, if it falls under this, this, and this, it goes to here, here, and here. Yeah, it, says, right? it actually says it right here. It says, if we go, sorry, this page right here, it's this table. Okay. This right here. Okay. Pointing out 14. 42. Okay. Got it. So it's, it's directing folks to the state. Perfect. Now I understand. No problem. Thank you. Yep. So that's exemptions from the development? Yeah? No, it's only if it's permitted. And in table. If so it's permitted by right, then they don't have to jump through all the hoops because it's already permitted. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, I like your comment, though, that I will make this right here um, a two-unit townhome. Yeah. I gotta think. I gotta think about that. But I understand. I understand your concern. I've never had that brought up because it's always multifamily after that. But yeah, we have a few of them on Oak Street. I think there's four there and I wasn't paying attention when all that happened and they got built but if you drive up Oak you'll see them on the right hand side what is not Oak Ash Ash, Ash. they're on Ash Street Did they get subdivided? well I really don't know how they got it through I don't it wasn't involved in that process I didn't pay attention when that was being built it was in the early 2000s well that's the one at the bottom down there mm -hmm. and I know there's some yeah. It was one that had a fire, didn't it? Yes. Yeah, is that the one that looks as the Spanish style? Yes. Yeah. The ones. Facade on it. You know, and I'm 99% sure. I'm not 100% sure. So going to this, I mean, the, the extent that someone can do something without going, coming in front of you, it's really single family and duplexes. Yeah. Uh, and then there's some um, administrative lot line adjustment stuff. Mm -hmm. Was there three or four? There's four, I think. Yeah. yeah. Two by two. Two by yeah. two. Yeah. So then, so going into so then to your point, anything that's in this list, variance, conditional use, minor subdivision, and then multifamily, commercial, and industrial developments all come from. Major impact, major subdivision, condominiumization, vacation or dedication of right away. The reason that's in there is because it requires an ordinance of the council, so it requires that. Subdivision improvements, um, planning unit development, and non-conforming usage structures. Those were your ones that you wanted to come in. So on that major subdivision, you know what we went through with Mr. Peters 
he was considered a major subdivision. Are you fixing those kind of little things to where he had he had a water main extension in his property, right? He had yes, he did. He would still be a major. Really? Well, the reason for that is the planning commission cannot take on public infrastructure by statute. The council must. Right. So what I did fix for him though is going into this next section, which is the development plan review. Um, which we can jump into next year. So you'll see that in the plan development plan review. So I'm gonna uh, let me let me not miss out on this. Sorry, um, yeah. No, you're fine. Exemptions. You'll see in here that exemptions will be classified as major impact if it requires any municipal facility to be extended. Extended. Got it. It's just the way it is. So that you, you're as a planning and zoning commission, you cannot take take. Sure. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, we did remove from so there. So had he not needed to extend water? Then he'd be a minor. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, the um, the staff did eliminate B um, as a as a as a kick to creating a kicking you into major because all your minor subdivisions have a park or trail dedication requirement right now. And so we didn't want everybody to get kicked to a major. So, so condominiumization will not be a major? No, 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 sorry, 4B. 4B. 4B right here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, got it. Here. So that's being struck completely. And that's actually on your drive, what they sent us. It actually has all that red highlighted yeah. stuff on there. This okay. doesn't depict that, but this, what, what showed up on your drive, actually depicts all of that. Yeah, okay. I, I included the red line on the drive. Um, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> and then going through, if you want to flip the page, this just outlines all the other ones that still remain there on articles. All right, so now we're going to jump into the meat of the discussion. So the development plan, if you're limited impact or your major impact, is what requires a development plan. So the first six, everyone has to do. No matter what you're doing, you got to show it. So you have to fill out an application. You got to pay your fee. You got to show that you own the property, <laughs> so you can file. Um, you got to show a certificate that you've paid your taxes, um, and then a, basically you have to provide a survey or some type of development plan and a narrative of what you're doing. So that's the bare minimum. I think everyone can understand that. Any requests for um, conditional use or zoning variance? As you recall in your code, in each of those sections, there's still review, review criteria, right? So the way this works is that if I'm asking for a conditional use, not only do I give you the first six, but then my narrative has to address the review criteria of uh, section 14.3. So the staff, when, you come, when I come in for a conditional use, is gonna say, you need these six things plus here is the review criteria. You have to show how you meet this review criteria in your narrative. So that's fine. And the review and criteria it, is where? It's still under conditional use. Okay. And the thing about it, the reason you can't move it up into here is because your conditional use, not only do you have your conditional, your set of criteria for conditional use, then you also have use specific criteria beyond that. And so to try to list all of that would have just been. Right, right. Um, then C, it says, any subdivision uh, requesting a final plat shall um, not only do meet the criteria of Article 5, which will have all of like the plat requirements, so the signature blocks, north arrow, blah, 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 but also have, this is the staff wanted in here, to also the public land dedication per 14-33. Make sure right up front they know that. Um, some minor changes came out of the staff to um, D. They want 11 by 17, um, and they don't really care about the scale, so they said an appropriate scale instead of the very minor comments. Um, number two, uh, again, anything that being the staff may uh, be necessary but not limited to the following. Uh, so again, if there's additional things, that could potentially need to come into play, they might need to submit that. 
And again, this is for developments. D, remember that D is for developments involving plot plan or site plan review. So these are like commercial or industrial uses. Where it makes sense to have additional things in my experience is that if you get a major industrial use that might have some kind of like waste flow issue or disposal issues, the staff can say, the planning commission is gonna to wanna to know about that. So please provide details on how you're gonna dispose of waste. Make sense? Um, any main extensions, basically this is saying that you have to engineer them, which makes sense, right? We don't want people not engineering water mains. All right, so now we're jumping into major impact. Again, the staff just changed the scale and may include but not limited to the following. Um, really what this gets into is it's basically saying that when you're doing major subdivision, you need to provide construction plans and profiles for any infrastructure you're doing. So that's the first whole entire um, A under A, one through one through five, one through seven, sorry. And then it gets into structural details. So again, this is this is more around things like ADA ramps, uh, drainage structures, grades, stuff that you would need to look at drainage. And then also looking at uh, your gas, electric, water, utility site plans, drainage reports, uh, gets into that. And again, the idea here is the staff can look at each of these and say yes or no, right? Then you get final grain plans, soils report, final street plan. Now, the one thing I will say on number five, they added AM to be dark sky compliant. So that one, um, there was a discussion around light fixtures and dark sky compliance. So does everyone know about the dark sky compliance measures that are going around? No. Do you know? So a lot of communities have adopted dark sky compliance around light fixtures, outside light fixtures, um, that basically, the whole, the whole idea is that you can see the, the stars at night. If you've ever been in a Walmart parking lot and you look up, you can't see stars. I'm sure if you've gotten camping, you look up, you know the difference when there's no light pollution around. A lot of communities and residential zones have required that all structures now have down-directed lighting. So basically, if you think about it, the light, this is the light bulb inside the fixture. The shield of the fixture, the bottom of the light bulb, can't go past the bottom of the shield. So the light is directed down. There is a whole lot of stuff around dark skies. You don't currently have it, and what I told the staff is that that's, again, outside of my purview for this, what we're talking about. However, they can require it on their infrastructure. So they have elected to that, if some of the developers are going to put in street lighting, now it has to be down facing. It's not a mandate. You can see it's not a mandate for everybody else. It's just a mandate for city infrastructure. I want to be real clear on that. If you guys want to look at that, that's a really worthwhile ordinance to look at. I can tell you I've lived in two communities that have it. It's a game changer. When, and, and I also tell you, <laughs> the biggest complaint I've ever dealt with is around floodlights. I can't tell you how many neighbors I've seen go tit for tat over floodlights and the floodlights shining into their neighbor's windows at night. And it gets even worse if you're in a vacation community where someone, when people come in and they don't know, they just start flipping lights and they turn on the floodlights outside and they leave them on all night and they go to bed and they're out. Like when you, you know your lights when you, when you live in a house, but this really becomes a big thing around vacation rooms. I, I, could, I tell you, that's my number one complaint over parties, everything with vacation rentals was the floodlights, <laughs> believe it or not. Because it keeps people, if you, if you live next to a vacation rental, someone turns it on and that light's on in their backyard all night, you're not going to sleep. You know these so, city lights like in the alleys? I don't know what those are called. Do you know the ones we have to pay $14 a month for? Oh, yeah. the arc lights. Arc lights. They're horrific. Yeah. The ones the city's putting in, they have been putting them with the facing yeah. down. They have been putting the newer the ones. The arc lights aren't. 
No. No, they had to come out to my house and put a shield so that it did the alley, and I'm paying for it. I didn't want it to go away because I wanted the alley to be seen. Right. But I didn't want it blaring into right. our house, so they put a shield, so it shields it from coming to the house. That's exactly what it does. Right. And when it across the us, it, it points down. Yep. And so this is saying for any new subdivisions, exterior lighting must be down facing. Even on the houses. So not on the houses, just on, just on, the, just on the street on the infrastructure street yeah. lights. Now you guys can you guys can talk about it. I will say that before you, if, if it's a, if it's something you're interested in. Maybe a recommendation you make to the city council. Again, there's a grandfathering of existing light fixtures. So right. And I'm just going to ask you about that. Yeah, you have to grandfather them because zoning is not. So then, if somebody were to change their lights, then they have to. Yes. See, that's what I mean. Then you're telling somebody what they have to do. Well, not on the personal house, on city infrastructure. Well, on city infrastructure, but no. I, I, but to answer your question, if you adopted a dark sky compliance. Uh, and you change your light fixtures. And See, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's where it gets. It's a two, way. it's a two face there. Mm -hmm. Well, and I will tell you that I dealt with that, um, and what it really came down to was I actually went personally as the planner went to Walmart, to Ace, to all my hardware stores, anyone that sold lights, and I gave them the ordinance. And I said, look, I went through there and I sat there with the manager. I said, non-compliant, non-compliant, non-compliant. If you sell this to them. And then I come out here and I and I issue them a citation for this light fixture. They're coming back to you, and you're going to have to you know you're taking a return. I'm like, just get rid of them. I'm like, nobody. I mean, and and, and I'll be honest with you, even Walmart <clears throat> got it. They're like, it's non-compliant. We want something here. And, and and it's, I think everyone is starting to value light fixtures that don't blind you and your neighbor. But I will say. It is a massive administrative hurdle because yes, it is. Because someone can say, "Nope, I didn't." And actually, <laughs> great story. My neighbor put shields around their lights, and when she changed the light bulb, she took the shield out. So now, and I'm the planner, and I I actually signed off on those lights. Now, when she turns on her lights, they go right in my kitchen. <laughs> I'm like, she took the shield. Out. She's like, "What is this little piece of metal in here for?" So she took it out. So I personally, when like now that I'm not the planner, and she did that, I like. Can't say anything, <laughs> but I was there. So, but this is again just for city infrastructure, landscape plan, uh, mineral oils documentation. That's a statutory requirement. Um, historic preservation protection plan if it's needed, and then again you can just see all of the all of the different permits. The work and right of way permit was changed to excavation permit, but they did get rid of. A rare species report, um, so they did get rid of K. The staff did, um, and I agree with that. In that, a your city and you have your documented species, and honestly, when you get into a rare species survey, you're actually in a federal application. You're in a you're in a NEPA application. So, and if you're in NEPA, this this is easy. <laughs> um, so. They did get rid of that. And there's a federal review process for endangered species anyways. All right, so that's the development plan. So we've gone from having uh, application materials in every single application to all containing in one spot. And these application materials are done when an applicant comes in, meets with staff, and receives, what you'll see here is a, is a, is a report back for a minute. So nice. Yeah, it, it, it really, really condensed it. Um, so then jumping into that, into um, the uh, administrative review, really the key here is that they submit, they have seven days for the, for the staff to determine to complete, and then the staff has 14 days to, or 20 days to make a, an interpretation on that. Within the 14 days, it goes in front of, if needed, need be, goes in front of development review meeting. It doesn't require the applicant to be there because it, hypothetically it should be something that's, I can tell you in all my years of doing administrative reviews, I normally bust them out in three days. They never sit on my desk because they're just, get up there. Now the only thing that ever really kind of languishes on administrative reviews are like lot line, 
eliminations or something that requires a subdivision because they bring in a subdivision, they bring in paper, then they gotta go back and get a mylar, and then bring it back to mylar. But that's on that. All right. Um, going then to the pre app. So, again, administrative reviews do not require pre app, so that's why it's ahead of pre app conference. So, then going into the pre app. Again, this is basically saying that the, the applicant under B brings in a concept plan. Uh, again, the idea here is that the, that the applicant doesn't need to bring in a full development plan at this point. They can bring in their concept, sit down with the staff, and the staff can give them the direction on what it's going to be needed. They can, a lot, I mean, a majority of the time, too, when you're doing development, you're like, I don't know where the names are. So it's really nice that the city already offers that on a Friday to have you come in and meet with the public works, meet with water utilities so that they can say, here's where the main is in relation to your property, here's where you tap, or here's where you need to extend. So after that, um, after that meeting, the manager shall classify the proposal as for limited impact or major impact. So that's when they make the determination. And at the same time, that's when they're telling them when, what and what, should, what will be required. And you'll see that here in a little bit. So then going to limited impact, again, the development plan comes in. Um, after the pre-application, this, this is where you see right here under number one. This is where the staff provides the written comment. The staff shall then submit a development plan including the information described in 1314 to 34. I want to make sure I got that citation right. Uh, look at that. Yes, I am. So that, that is again referencing this whole list. So after the pre app, they receive written comments, and that's when they know what is required. And then all this is saying is it goes once it's incomplete, it gets scheduled. We talked with Audrey and Chris about the dates and times. All of this is predicated on public notice. So anything that goes in front of you needs the site needs to be noticed, it needs to be put in the paper, and there needs to be adequate adequate notice. So basically this is saying it needs to be a month ahead of the planning and zoning to allow that them to prepare public notice and deem it complete. And make sure it's a complete application when they publish. There's an agency review that happens within that four week period, within 20 days. And then again, I struck, I had in here, you'll see the staff struck Board of Adjustment applications. You do not have a Board of Adjustment. I apologize about that because you are the Board of Adjustment because you do variances. And then again, it says you, should, you can either approve require additional information, which is tabling, or deny the application at your meeting. Further review, so if you table it, again, number five just basically gives the applicant direction on if it was tabled. They have, a, they have to at least submit 10 days ahead of your meeting again, so it can be republished. Normally you, as a, as a planning commission, planning and zoning experience commission, you should always, you shouldn't table, you should always um, make a motion to a, to continue to a date certain. So if you table and you don't say a date certain, then you have to re-notice. But if you say to a date certain, you do not have to re-notice under statute. So just as as a as something that is very kind to your staff, always choose a date and continue to a date because that allows the staff then to not have to complete, completely re-notice everything. To be just tabled. Just, just FYI. All right, major impact. Again, here's the big one. This is number one, and this is the concept review. So the the the, the city council has the power on a major impact to bring you in, or not. If it's a major, if it's truly a major development. I've always seen the council bring in the Planning and Zoning Commission. That concept meeting is a very informal meeting where the applicant presents their application and 
Normally, there's three or four questions that come from the city council or the planning and zoning commission. But it's really the opportunity for the applicant to hear any major concerns. So it's like, you know, like, I don't think the exit, the exit and the turning radiuses for that exit on your new road are going to work. Like, you're going to need to put in a whole new road. Or, you know, this, this, there's 100 units in this development. This is going to be its own neighborhood. Where are the kids going to play? Like, big ticket items, right? So, on a major impact, you know, it could be, hey, sewer, this current sewer main doesn't have an, isn't, isn't sized correctly. You're going to have to replace the sewer main, not just in front of your property, but three blocks up. But that would not, that would be more staff, right? More than the city. It, it would, but the big thing about this is, is that this joint meeting, what's really nice about the joint meeting, is that they are coming, they're coming with an application that looks something like, here's a great, Cougar Canyon or something. Yeah, but they're coming to you with um, something that looks, that is that is this simple. Because the nice thing is, is as, as a developer, um, let me see if this is it. Again, as a developer, like this, I did ever, I put this, proposal together over a weekend. You can see that I could come with this development proposal under concept review. This level, this level of, right, is a hand-drawn sketch by me. Does this tell you everything you need to know about the subdivision? Absolutely not, right? I actually did full, I, once I got approval, I did full engineering, I did cross band, I did utility extensions. You know, I spent $30,000 on engineering work. The council and the planning commission now are able to look at that and say, that'll work for us. Like the, this, this will fit in the neighborhood, we understand what you're doing. And then again, they say, at that meeting you say, well here's our concerns. Like during this meeting they said, this is a big multifamily development. They said, Michael, it would be really nice if we could build a little neighborhood playground for all the kids that are going to live in this new subdivision. So we dedicated a half acre park. So those were the kind of decisions that kind of came out. And so then I knew right up front that they wanted a little park, and I created it. But that's that concept review. This is, what, this is like the level of what you're looking at. From there, then they go into a full development plan. So again, they'll get their letter, uh, they'll know what they need to submit under the development plan, and that's when the time starts to, to click. So they have six months from the first time they meet with the, with the planning and zoning and the council to come back with a full development plan. The from the conceptual review. From the conceptual review. If they don't get back in here within six months, they have to come back and get another concept review. Normally, though, they're a little bit further down the line. They've met with staff already, so they're normally ready to submit within a month or two. The biggest thing about this is uh, that it goes, it goes from concept, they submit their full application, they go in front of the department and agency review before before you before you see it. The department agency review has occurred. So when you get the application on step five, you will have staff comments. They have reviewed the application. Again, you approve or deny, and you send it on to the to the uh, city council. Um, at that point, under number seven, the city council either affirms or reverses your decision. And then they can file their plats and their final development plan. So at that point, they have 60 days to file plats, etc., uh, and get going. Um, now, if they have actual infrastructure they're doing, they will need to, again, before any issuance of occupancy or acceptance, They'll need to actually provide as built. Am I? Do you guys require a warranty? Uh, I don't believe so. 
Yeah. We don't mention to your warranty on any infrastructure. Maybe, maybe we do. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure, Michael. Okay. I think it's in the insurance yeah. requirements. Yeah, it might be. Um, the only thing I will say here um, on this table, you can review it for yourself. The reason this is highlighted is the HPC right now is looking at whether or not they might do processes around review of, of designs. So instead of deleting it from this table, I'm going to wait to hear where they want to go because reformatting these tables is quite onerous. Um, I did get confirmation um, on the annexation. So, last thing on here is um, again, this is the most important one. This is concurrent review. So, sorry, my mouse keeps scrolling down to the bottom. So, well, so what this is saying is. The current review allows someone to have multiple applications. So Holy Trinity <coughs> came in last week. They had a minor subdivision. They had two conditional uses. And this new process, instead of the staff having to notice for minor and for conditional use and you guys taking, considering both those actions in a different meeting or at different times, you can consider both of them under limited impact. So their application, when it would be noticed, and what you would be seeing before you'd be a limited impact review for the following. Minor subdivision, conditional use. In all reality, I'm sure you know this as planning commissioners, you want to look at the whole thing. This allows you to do that. This little, last little paragraph right here. And where? Is is four, is uh, thir 1439 concurrent review point two. Four minute of final submission on the last page. On the last page. It's okay. Kind of, it's, it's kind of, yep, got it. it. It really is a game changer for folks that have complex applications because they can they can come in. And the other nice thing too is like you guys might notice what something in their application that would require maybe an additional conditional use. You're able to tackle those things because you're reviewing the whole plan holistically. I think we just had something like this not too long ago. This is what we did for Trinity. Um, Trinity or even, um, sorry, I didn't mean That's that. Not, um, oh. Over there, where, where Dana White fought, didn't Dana buy her over there where PDC used to have their office? Oh, in the corner of Pine. Oh, the yeah. Didn't we? Oh, over there, the Pine Street. Line. Yeah. I think we uh, had, at one meeting, we had to did. They come up, they said they something, reason. and then they came back up and had something. So this would kind of take care of that, where we wouldn't have had to do that. We could have dealt with everything all at one time. Yes. Gotcha. But then there's a lot of ways they could slip stuff in there. You guys, your 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 job is think think about how your job is. Your your job is to look at a development holistically, look at everything. This gives you that power. So when I submit, I'm submitting my whole development plan to you, and you're looking at it holistically. Now, I still have to meet the, re I still have to address conditional use criteria, I still have to address plat requirements, et cetera, but it allows you to make a determination on one application. So like what happened last week? Yeah. Like you, like last week, you guys would have been like, "Sorry, we're continuing to a date certain, so that we can deal. We're not comfortable with the conditional use." Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were basically dealing with the conditional use permit for apartments on, been for apartments on the lower the floor. Thing. Then they put in that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Now on this. Top of it. Now this says they can separate. This does not say that they have to come in together. It says they they can. So they can still pull out one application and just get approval for the one. But nine times out of 10, no one's gonna do that. They're gonna come in with their whole application. Their, uh, their, their, their application is unique in that they have to have a sign off on the ground floor apartments to right. qualify for a $10 million grant. Right. Normally that's not the case. Normally you bring in the whole thing, but again, they had 22 days notice of that grant. So I feel for him because I'm that proposal I just showed you is going for this exact same phone money. So I've been, been working around the clock, but that's the way. I mean, normally you have like 
90 days on grants like that. Otherwise, they would try to, but that's not the point here. Really. But the fees still apply. Separate fees still apply. No, because you'll now have an administrative review, a limited impact review, and a major something. Major major impact review fee. That's it. Just the three. So they can pay. They can pay for one fee now. If they want to separate it out and they want to do two limited impact reviews, like at different times, then they'll have to pay the fee. The I'm just talking about concurrence. Concurrence is just one fee. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay. Just that we'll, we'll both work down with the yeah. Let's, but no, it's it's one fee. Because really, the nice thing about it too is. If you think about it, when you pay a fee for, you're paying a fee for the for the staff time, for the noticing, et cetera, right? If you only have to notice it once, and they're getting all their applications, then you have to know what's right with the staff report. That's true. Right? So it's also a lot of this. I'm not going a lot of this. Uh, I wrote myself in slide selfishly because <laughs> I was so sick of pounding in four different signs on the same property <laughs> next to each other. I was like, wait a minute, I'm like, oh, I don't understand. Did they get I was like, oh, this is like, yes, they're all one application. They're like, why is this person doing four houses? They're like, it's one house. It's one house. It's, these need four different things. They're like, I don't understand. I was like, neither do I, but I'm a planner, so what do I know? All right. Any other questions on this? Any comments? You like it? I do. I do. I kind of read. I'm just sorry we don't have more more people here tonight. <clears throat> and I just got a little while ago when I was coming in here. He thought that 23rd was on Tuesday. Oh no! I'd be willing to bet you he did, and he did. She sent out an email. You could accept it and it put it right in your calendar. Yeah, I know. <laughs> do you all like that better? I did. I love that. Yeah. I do. I don't remember yeah. pushing yes, oh, that's but it just automatically it's came through. Not like that, but you can go up there to the top and accept it now. Yeah. It's on your calendar and you get a reminder. It's I a love it. All right, so let's talk about next steps then. So you like this. We'll carry this forward. So at your next meeting in February, I'm going to bring back subdivisions, zoning, uh, and signs. And the reason for signs is because you have a review process under, it's the uh, variance to the sign permit application. Uh, what's it called? What do you guys want me to call that? Slim bit impact. But that's the only section that changes. It's called, it is called non conform or no, exemption or variance of sign regulations. So that section will just change to be on the impact review. Um, so I'm going to bring those back in February. Uh, and then in March, in February, I'm going to hand out information on ADUs. And we can also talk about any other things that you want to potentially address in the code. And we will start to tackle a little bit more stuff in your code. The reason I'm bringing you guys stuff on ADUs is your ADU code, like, is this is bad. It doesn't, like, you can build a house on the, you can build an ADU on the front of the lot right now. It, 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 it doesn't make sense. I also, though, want to really kind of like take ADUs like this, throw it over my shoulder, and really talk to you guys about what you want to see with ADUs, and then really kind of just go through the nuances. I can tell you that I have dealt with ADUs in every stop in my career, so I, I, know I am an expert on it. Like, I am the housing expert, that's why you guys are paying me. I'm happy to talk through the nuances with AUs. There's actually, um, we will hand out the next meeting, there's uh, AARP has, and you can look it up, you can type in Google AARP ADUs. They actually, AARP does a really good job with their pamphlet on ADUs. For this commission, one of the most important things for you to realize is that our aging population, a lot of folks 
being able to stay in their homes and age in place are going to be dependent on the ability potentially to build a Navy yield. And it depends on what, where you put it. Yep. Yeah. And, and I think what I want to do with this, because currently the way it's written, there's a lot of things in there that, like I brought it up during a development review meeting, there was a lot of, a lot of discussions around like subdividing them off, like attached and detached. Attached, detached. What I want to hear from you when we start the discussion is, what are your concerns? Let's start at, let's start at 100,000 feet. Let's talk about your concerns, what you're seeing. Let's, I want you to read the ARP, it's like, what, 10 pages? Mm -hmm. And it, it does a really good job because it shows examples from like San Francisco, Denver, all these different codes. And, it, and, it, and it's, an, it's an independent of me, right? It's an independent of my decision. Um, but in March, we can kind of start going through that in that discussion. And there's lots of different ways you can regulate them. But it's a conversation that you guys need to have because unfortunately, it's already in your code, and what's in your code doesn't make any sense. So we have to deal with it. I think we've battled through some of that. In right. the past. And you can't, you can't compare Trinidad to Denver. No, I understand. I mean, Trinidad is Trinidad. Sure. The nice thing about the ARP thing, is it shows lots of different examples so that you can you can look it's like looking at a menu. And that's what I like about it because I have my own menus of things I did. The only other thing I'll say from what I was brought in to do, which is affordable housing, in Crested Butte and Salida, Crested Butte and Salida, both those communities have zero affordable housing without ADUs. And here's why. Rentals are impossible to build from the public side of things. Rentals have to come from the private side. A single family homeowner being able to build an ADU and generate rental income is not only good for them, it's also good for the city because they create an additional rental unit. Which is again, from where I sit, and like what I'm doing right now about those duplexes I just showed you, like I'm gonna be bald in a month when I come but back But the here. person that builds the ADU on their property should own that ADU. Correct. And you, it shouldn't be a vacation rental. Right. Correct. <laughs> See, these are all good. Because that's what they want to do with it here. No. Nope. So the, those are all things that both of those are correct. When, I will, you, when, I, you, when you do that, sooner or later somebody's going to do an A, B, and B out of that. You can prohibit that. Yeah. That's what has to happen. Yeah. You mm -hmm. don't, I, I will tell you that you, you, again, from my experience, the, the, it, you have to look at a carrot and stick approach to, to what we use. The carrot is that the city is getting a non deed restricted affordable housing unit that's driven by the private sector, and the owner is getting a benefit of additional rental income. What it isn't is not them building a whole new residence and selling it off and creating a different property. The other big thing is like, I live on my house, I live right next to an ADU, my, they build an ADU in my backyard. She, the owner lives in an ADU and rents the front of the house. I'll tell you, if I had two separate owners living right next to me, and I had that person in my looking into my backyard every day, I would go nuts. Right. But whenever I have an issue, the owner's on site, and I can just go tap on her door and go, hey, you know, the runners are kind of not doing And something. then in, in Trinidad, you can do that. But you have to have the parking. Yep. So it doesn't problem, matter. Our problem here is that we're, we're a little bit gun-shy right now. We were hit so hard with that ADU, it was unbelievable. And, uh, but I think ADUs are, are a, a place for them, but not in the whole wide city, just any place you want. Mm -hmm. And as I, many as you want. Right. <laughs> No, you can only have one. No, I think what he meant is like, if you pick like the original town site of Trinidad, you can't have them. It doesn't make sense to have them in OTS, right? Everywhere. Um, but how do you, that's the thing, how do you pick like, okay, well, what streets would it work on, right? Because mm -hmm. if you look at our maps, which I'm sure you have, you have lots that are anywhere which are out, you know, non-conforming, legal non-conforming from 3,000 square feet to six, right? Mm -hmm. Um, 
It's not going to, I mean, hardly anything fits on 3,000 square feet, and two houses don't fit on 6,000 square feet. So it's like, how do you, how, because of the way our maps were done, it's yep. hard. Yep, I understand. Yeah, like you go up Colorado Avenue, you might have one lot that's 100 feet wide, and then one that's 25 foot wide. It's already, it's kind of a, <laughs> yeah. So I think we'll have a full meeting in March. It's a big one. We're going to have to just saw you. People are going to be screaming. Well, it's it's okay because currently the way it's written, it's very, very problematic. And we can keep in, you know, keep it the way it is. But And then you don't want to change the neighborhood by putting ADUs in there all over. It well, changes the conception of the neighborhood. Especially low density community. residential. Yep. You don't want to destroy the history of our community with ADUs. And again, all this stuff is 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 what you guys are appointed, not elected, but appointed to deal with. So this is this is the big bag, a ten pound bag and a five pound. So Do you have suggestions? I, you I, 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 the, looking at like how I do just, have su I do have suggestions, but here's the deal. I can't make any of those suggestions until I hear a comment like that that says we're worried about the fabric earth. Because those are good comments. Mm -hmm. Those are very important comments. And so I don't want I, I I, I always come at a place, I always want to make recommendations from a space of having gotten the knowledge from the Planning and Zoning Affairs Commission or from the folks in the community before I ever make a suggestion. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that. The only thing I've done is read your ADU, and I was like, whoa, there's some things in here that don't make sense. I um, agree with that. And things that don't make sense. And so the other thing is that from where I sit, from what I was brought on to do, again, housing, ADUs are, there's two things that ADUs do. One, they create rental, but more importantly, the boomer generation is aging out of their housing stock. And a lot of boomers can't afford to buy a, a one level house or something like that. What they can afford to do is build a four to 700 square foot ADU in the backyard it's all, and build a brand new, put in walk-in showers, have no steps, et cetera, and then be able to continue to age in place. That's why AARP does what they, that's the publication is because they realize a lot of retirees are in a situation where they can't, the price of real estate's gone way up, right? And so if you're in a situation where, and then my grandmother, God rest her soul, I watched climb up three flights of steps to get to her front porch and another two flights of steps to get to her bedroom. When she was 88, I caught her crawling up the steps. She was the worst thing that we ever had to go through a spin my grandmother at her house. This is the kind of thing that allows us to allow people to age on the property. So it's, it's, there's a mobility piece, there's a rental piece, and those are all the kind of considerations that you as planning commissioners need to think about. Because it, it really is gonna, it's gonna come full, full, full head at some point. And it's coming sooner rather than later. And, and again, you know, it's just it's one of those. So you housing mobility is one of the things that Trinidad really does has a major deficit. You have, I think, it was in the need assessment, seventy percent of your housing stock single family. You don't really have the townhomes. You don't really have the apartments. You don't really have ADUs. Those types of things that allow for seniors for the aging population to move out when they can no longer maintain single. That's gonna be a big deal for your community. Yeah, it already is. So it's it's what that's why I want to talk about ADUs um, and really kind of dive into that and hear the concerns. And I'm gonna do that when in, in March. In March. In March. And I'd like to see people that want to do affordable housing do affordable housing for seniors. They keep doing affordable housing for everybody else. But not for seniors and that's one of the big things that's a problem in our community if you look at the income levels of our seniors and I'm not exaggerating some of them are living on 800 and so a basic Social Security check they can't afford to do an ADU they've inherited the house they barely can pay the taxes they're not building ADUs they can barely they can't even fix a broken window in their houses those are the people that need to be able to move on 
to affordable, affordable subsidized, housing, yeah. yeah, for 55 plus, but so far we're not getting that, we're just getting the other. Yeah, community is unique. It is. We're unique here. You've got seniors, you've got middle class people in their 40s, and then you've got people from in their 20s into 30s. And you, I know you've probably worked all over. I've done all this all over. But here in Trinidad, it's unique. It's a unique situation. The parking is really bad. Yeah, no, I, I can... You can go up t today if you want to go up Ash. Go down Main Street and go up Ash. Well, I've done it. I've seen it. I mean, mm -hmm. you're They're parked on both sides. And Baca is another one. And there's, no, and there's no driveways. People don't have driveways. Well, you can't drive on... you got to... On some streets, you got to... Pull over to the side to let the other guy right. go by. That's Ash Street. And so there's places in the backyard that you could put one of them. But a lot of places. Yeah, where they can to go down the alley. Yeah, right. That yeah. aren't maintained. <laughs> I, I would give anything to have my street narrowed by ten feet so that when cars come at each other, they have to stop and slow down. But that's that's a that's a preference. But that that is that's that's traffic control. It's, it's all on squeezing now. Even, even it's like snow, when it snows like today. Even uh, in Allendale. Mm -hmm. like, Look at Allendale. Yeah. Allendale, most of the people park in the street. They got a driveway. And there might be one car in the driveway, but there's two in the street at the same residence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. And, and I think parking is a, is a, you know, the way that most folks deal with the parking issue with an ADU is they put, they put it above a garage. Well, like on Baca Street, if you drive that, there are no driveways. There is no way to, there is no, there's like garages in the alley. So then what, does the city now take on a responsibility of having to maintain the alley so that people can build a garage or an ADU? You know, it opens, there's just so, Trinidad is not, it wasn't, it wasn't planned well. <laughs> it wasn't planned so, in the future. It wasn't, right. Well, and right. I, I can tell you, so like an example of what you just brought up about the alley is in Crescent View, we did not plow alleys. We did not plow the alleys. And if you build an ADU, it's in the, it has to be in the rear of a structure. Trenta doesn't plow. They don't take down the weeds. They don't fill potholes. If you live on an alley, I fill potholes. Yep. <laughs> I, I maintain the whole entire alley because I'm the only one that cares. So I start from the college parking lot, and I work my way out to Willow Street. And we just do it because we live there. Yep. Um, city doesn't do it. And, and, uh, and she's got to go, basically go up her alley to get in her garage. Yeah. And there's a lot of them here in Trinidad that have to do that. Mm -hmm. There's no way to get to it from the street. Well, one side is a college property, right? Mm -hmm. She can't go through the college property to get to her property. Well, I do. Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I don't yell at the, the baseball players too often when they fly 300 miles an hour down the drive. Either, so. But it's yeah. just a, it's a unique situation as far as when you're talking about ADUs in Trinidad. There is places probably, but it's got to be really thought out well. And the answer can be no ADUs. I mean that that can be the answer too. I mean I'm, I'm not. I don't think it has to be the answer. I think like Mr. Matarano said, there's a place for them. But how do you figure that out? Right. I think some of it has to be. And in our in our story, in our comprehensive plan. In the orange section is where we had tiny houses. You got some beautiful tiny buildings, houses. and like down Colorado Avenue and and, and and Nevada, and there's some beautiful buildings. And then if you if you congest it with a bunch of ADUs, it's going to destroy that history. Well, and what's the problem like with Colorado Avenue? I manage one of the properties, actually two properties on Colorado Avenue that they already broke the rules a long time ago. They're grandfathered in, they're duplexes, triplexes. So Colorado Avenue, you almost can't even have that argument because one of the, like there's a property on the corner of Willow and Colorado Avenue, I think it's got eight yeah. in it. Yeah, that's a black you know? and white one. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so convoluted. Yeah. Everywhere there's, there's several houses like that, mm -hmm. but that's not an ADU. Well, it's more I mean, family. it's considered an ADU, but it's not a separate dwelling. Six Eleven Colorado is looks like a single family house, and it's three. It's got the garage apartment. Well, you know, you've been in there, 
and then the main house was turned into two units. So, but it's a big giant lot. You know, it's 100 feet by, I mean, there's plenty of room, like for the garage apartment to have its place. You know, it makes sense. It's yeah, because not, there's plenty of place for parking here. Right, and it's not packed in, you know, to a 50, 50 foot wide lot with no access into the property. That's where it gets. Yep. All right. So if you have ideas how it could work everywhere in Trinidad, I would love to hear it. <laughs> no, no, I, I, again. Or how to maneuver around that, because if you say low density, it's allowed in low density. Well, that can't be, because low density is all of what we just discussed. I mean, my, my immediate, and my immediate brain goes to conditional uses for ADUs. And, Which is how it's been, right? Uh, it's been conditional use for ADUs. Mm -hmm. But there's still some the way some of that stuff is worded. It's it, like it it works good for this situation, but not, not good for, for this one. situation. Right. And I think, like he was saying, you know, right. like when we look at it, because you've got attached, not detached, you know, and there's all this wording about your lots has got to be this size, and, right? You know, like, 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 yeah, it doesn't work here, but it works here. Right. And you can't sell out, right? No, it, you. The, the, I, we talked about that at staff. The the sale of them is not a, that's a that's a deal breaker. You do not allow them, so you can't sell the back of your you can't sell the back here. Right. right. They're permitted. Your house. They're not currently conditional use. They're permitted, but they have they have a review these, criteria, but right. they don't come in front of you. If they don't meet it, they would have to come for conditional use. So right now they have to come for conditional use because most properties don't meet the standard as it's drawn out. Or they'd have to ask for a variance, really, right? A variance. A variance. That's, that's, yeah. That, well, yeah. A variance. I, I think, hearing your concerns, I think to, again, I want to I talk to the staff. I want to really understand um, before I put my mouth again. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's, it's the truth. It's, it's, I mean, it, it, I, I can give you a code, but it's... The, the magic of what I give you is if it actually works. And I can't give you something that will work unless I know all the issues. Right. And I haven't, I haven't dug in. I, I, we, had, we had a very similar, robust conversation with the staff, and it went a thousand different directions. And they asked all these, and I was like, I had to do a big timeout. Every time. Out, one right. question at a time. <laughs> you know, and I, I would. I did that work pretty well. It drives us crazy. It, it really does. It worked through them. It's a lot of. How many months did we go Stop. through that ADU deal? Oh my God, I don't even want to do that. <laughs> I, yeah, let's but when we were going through it, basically, our planning and zoning director wanted to put them everywhere. Wherever they fit, let's put them. And, and you can't do that in a low density residential neighborhood. You're changing the complete complexion of the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah I agree. And, not at and all then you have no parking. And he said, oh, you could pyramid parking. Oh, he said no cars. Were, people are getting away from cars. People, yeah, they want. Ride a bike. They're going to ride bikes too. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Because people don't drive anymore. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Matarano had a good question about um, adding hostels in the code. So, so you can address that. Yeah, I can address that. I, what I will tell you is, I, I don't think you. I think hotel in the in the context. If you read your definition of hotel, you know. It, I'll read you the definition. I don't know that. Well, no, I think the definition of hotel met, they meet the def, they met the definition of a hotel. Um, because well, you don't have the amenities. But your definition doesn't require that. Here's your definition. So, one second. hotel. Hotel motel shall mean a building or a group of attached or detached buildings designed for occupancy by short-term or part-time residents who are lodged with or without meals, so it doesn't require a kitchen, and with, in which no facilities are provided for cooking in an individual rooms. It doesn't say anything about individual bathrooms. It doesn't say anything about that. So it just says individual rooms. So I think what they're planning of having a room with a micro fridge and then having a shared bathroom. But they're also having bunk rooms, they're not individual rooms. Again, it's, it's just saying... Is it it says individual rooms. Yeah, but it says residents who are lodged. 
So you can have multiple people in a room. I'm just, I, I, I can, I, I, have, I, I have a definition for hostels from a different code that I wrote. Yeah. I can look at. I understand where your concerns are. Um, I think they, they are, per your code, are a hotel. How, how hard is it to do a hostel definition? And we can do it. In there. We can do it. Yeah. But it's not addressed in your use table. So you need all these standards. I, I I think you know. Let me let me just do on that one too. But your current definition of hotel, in my opinion, they meet it. But individual rooms means individual rooms. It doesn't mean bunk rooms with bunk beds. There's I mean, my that's hotel, a group room, not an individual room. My hotel room has two beds. Just me. But two. you're. That's one rental for one person going in. So, like, if you go in with a partner, or a friend, I get. I yeah. understand. What you're saying that multiple people can rent in the same room. Correct. It's All a right. group room. It's not an individual room. I I agree with you that the. I, I think what they're envisioning though is I don't think they're envisioning like the Euro hostel, like where you are having a bed. Yeah. Um, yeah, because like the ones I looked into in Boulder. They were a disaster, and they closed them all. I don't want to see that for Trinidad. Uh, yeah, I think I think your point on the hotel rooms is, uh, or the on the shared beds is one thing. I don't think that they. I don't want to speak for the applicant on that, but I don't think they ever intended that you would just be renting a bed. I he, think he said they had they were going to have bunk rooms. Well, I think they're going to have bunk rooms, but it's under one reservation. Because oh. what that what they have told me is like it would be like if I'm a drywall company and I'm bringing in like my drywall crew, I have like four employees. We would share a bunk room. So I think they're I think that's a good limitation that like, like a bunk room. What the what the staff could do is limit that they can't rent beds. They can only rent rooms. So maybe a hostile definition really does need to be put in place. But then you also need to look at review criteria. How hard is that? <laughs> so, like making that graph? No, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it is. It, it's well, it's, it's again. Because they might have one opinion of how they're going to run their business, and then Joe Blow comes and wants to do the same thing, but he doesn't have that high quality and thought process. And if we allow them to do it without a definition and rules, what's to stop something like that happening in Boulder happening in Trinidad? Yeah, no, I, I understand. Um, well, a couple things. One is it's free market, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're in a bad business, and right, right, right. business. Okay, so yeah. You can't control everyone. Right, because. but they have rules in place for sexual orientation businesses. Yeah. They have rules in place for marijuana, which that's another thing I want to bring up to you. Mushrooms. Now that that's uh, an issue. Nope, we're not. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's I, I not in the code. <laughs> I, I'm not touching. You know, it's not, real, I mean, real funny story real quick. But I'm just being serious when, that it's not in the code. So when marijuana became illegal, my mother Googled me. And I, so Salida was one of the first places to deal with yeah, it. Yeah. And so I was on national headlines <laughs> of Michael Yerman, like, doing right. And I was running the zoning. Mm -hmm. And my mother was like, I can't believe you're out there in Colorado just smoking pot. And I'm like, oh, oh, I'm like, I'm creating zoning law. And she's like, I find it in Google. Your name is associated with marijuana. And you're never going to go And I was like, so I just had like flashbacks. So your I'm, mouth's going to call you wrote a mushroom law. Yeah, no, oh, so that's why I just had flashbacks. I'm going to explain to my mother why I'm like, Nationally. But that is something the city needs to think about. That is. That's. N I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That is a, and that, that policy decision comes from the council, if they're going to want to consider that. Mm -hmm. And what the states can do as far as even what kind of regulations. So, not touching that one. <laughs> you can give me with the ABUs, but not with that one. <laughs> I, can always, I can see my mother falling out. So what's our date for February? Good question. I think that's up to you, to you guys. Is it another work session? I when is our next meeting for February? Oh, it is currently. I don't have any applications. Okay. 
but uh, it is the 7th. The 7th? Uh, no, the 14th. Yes, that's Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. Yeah, let's not do that that day, <laughs> guys. Um, can we, can we She's taking her granddaughter out, so I know she ain't going to be here. I'm babysitting. <laughs> okay, well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah, now, let's pick you, another day besides Valentine's Day. If you want to propose a work session, um, that could be like uh, any, the 27th is a good day because President's Day is the 20th. The 27th is on a what? Monday. It's on Monday. It's up to you guys. Do you I do, know, do, you do work sessions on the fourth Mondays? Um, yeah, there probably would be a council work session. But they're at 3 p.m. They should be done by then. Okay. You want a 27th then? Let's do 5.30 just so we don't run into council if we want to do it on the 27th. Yeah. The 27th works really well for me. Okay. 27th? That's fine with me. I'm good. So the most likely there's no meeting then at this well, stage in the game? I can't I say it's not, but this at this time... time. Uh, hmm? uh, the, the window is closing. Before we, uh, I, I like your presentation, and uh, I think everybody up here got a little bit more knowledge of what you're doing. Yet. And so we're going to be combining these all together when in March. I before we, I I want to get through just process. Okay. We will be done with the process in February. There's a couple of additional, um, there's like the public notice section that I'll add, and there's a couple of definitions to fix. Then we're done. And I want to take that before the council and get that going so that this process is in place for the next development season. So I want to get through that. Then I'm here through June, and on my agenda is to look at housing issues next. And so ADUs is number one, because it's already in the code like that. Um, and then to look at any other kind of housing issues that you want to look at. On top of that, there's an area-wide planning that's going on, um, the process that the city is taking on. We just had a discussion on that today. You are going to be asked for one of the planning commission members, and Steve, you probably could get at that point tonight, huh? It's not on the agenda. Uh, that's true. So we really can't have, have discussions about things that aren't on the agenda. Um, there's an area-wide planning which is looking at the downtown. It's led by a different consultant. But the idea behind that is to, to bring forward any kind of zoning recommendations. So we selected April to look at any recommendations with a joint work session of the council and the planning commission from their work on the downtown looking at the zoning code and seeing if there's any impediments to developing downtown property. So my goal is to, in March, next steps is to work with you on ADUs, try to come to some kind of idea in April to look at any plan and zoning recommendations coming out of uh, the downtown pro planning process. Uh, and that could include commercial recommendations that I can assist with, and then really kind of wrapping up. Um, historical districts too. The historic district is the area area plan. Um, I slammed out. Um, it's it's the downtown. It's what they're looking at the area wide planning, and it's and that money is that planning process. Just so you understand, that planning process is being funded through the EPA. So the EPA in the grant that the city got for doing environmental processes. The EPA recognizes that, yeah, it's great to give a property owner an assessment of like, here's all the stuff that you need to clean out of your property. No, it's dollars but, but then there's no like, there's no city follow through to like, how do you make it easier for people to deal with this? So they include in there the ability for a consultant to come in and make recommendations on how to update zoning and development regulations to assist property owners to get get those properties back in the room. And we had a, uh, we had that survey, remember, when we watched on the, and you were supposed to get us that whole. I drop. I, I can drop it in your drive. Yeah. 
was we were supposed to all get a copy of that remember the housing survey no, no. The, was it the brown that one? that was about the the brown the, fields right right is that the one you're talking about no we're talking about all the stuff that they'd have to do for to get rid of like asbestos and stuff like that we Isn't had that, that oh, the, oh oh you're talking about the preliminary meeting we had with epa yes epa yes, yes and yes. you were supposed to get us that so that it was a copy you of didn't that. really provide me with a copy that so, so that's well, yeah. let, me, let me help you out on that that's coming so through this process we, we had a kickoff meeting discussion today through that process that's they're gonna they're gonna have the it, we had a presentation yeah yeah so we so that what you had a presentation on is what i'm talking about the area wide planning mm -hmm. They're actually, so from what they're going to, as part of the area I'm planning, not only do they look at the downtown area and come up with redevelopment strategies and zoning recommendations, as well as, as part of that whole public process, then they're getting the reason EPA funds the planning piece is to let property owners know that they are eligible for these funds. So that will be forthcoming. So I would just, I would say what they probably mid February is yeah. really when they kick off and the more information is going to be made available. Yep. Like we're, 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 today we were just talking about stakeholder committees and meeting dates and just the calendar. So we're, you're, you're about a, you're about two weeks ahead of us. Okay. But we're getting there. We're getting there. So, um, and like I said, you know, and, and then the only other thing I'll mention on March and April and May and looking at the other zoning stuff is my, the other reason I'm kind of deliberately not taking that on is that I want the new planner to be in here. So that the new planner can be part of these code revisions and be part of these processes, because ultimately they're also going to have to be dealing with that, with that. So I think, as far as process is concerned, it's very clean cut. It's this is this is just this is well within the guardrails of what the council. But when we start to go into these um, in April, we're going to have a joint work session with the council and the planning commission to talk about these additional zoning considerations. So. Um, and again, I'm very, you know, if you haven't noticed, I stay in my guardrails. And so if we want to start talking about ADUs and stuff, which I'll let the council know, you know, I want them to bless it because what happens is if you guys open up a, open up a beehive or a water, pound of wasps and ask the wasps go in their direction. <laughs> well, I appreciate the way that you talk to us. No problem. I'm glad you, glad this is working out. Because we have people that talk at us, sitting in the same place you were. Is there, not to change that, but is there is there any work words on the new planning? Yeah, we, we've done, a, we did interviews last week, and we're hoping to extend an offer to a candidate this week. So we're still, we have one more meeting with that candidate tomorrow, and we're hoping that we'll be able to extend an offer after that time. So soon, hopefully. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. Not that you haven't done a great job. Oh, Versus I'm ready great. to <laughs> hand it right over. <laughs> <laughs> she is. All right. What are you in this work session? It's doable. <laughs> do you want to? <laughs> yeah, doable. <do> <laughs> Mine, but uh, Leone here. Spain. It's Coker here. Matarano here. Norris and Rolo here. Did I miss Mark Ar 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 Yes, not here. Sorry. Thank you. That. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.